Grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we are united today by a common sorrow, a common affection, and a common hope. We gather today in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection, and we gather to give thanks to God for the life of Barbara Kelly, to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and to proclaim the good news of eternal life in Jesus Christ. We pray the words and music of this service bring comfort to the family and friends, and that the gift of the Holy Spirit provide comfort beyond understanding. As stated by the Apostle Paul, we are to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and to mourn with those who are mourning. In the spirit of such togetherness, immediately following the service, the family invites you all to a reception at the Saturn Club. The family will greet you there, and Jerry will share a video highlighting the life of his beloved Barbara. The address and parking instructions are in your bulletin. In his letter to the church in Rome, Paul wrote the following. I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. With the assurance of this promise, let us stand and join our voices in hymn number 478, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
please be seated. Let us pray. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of all those who have kept the faith, finished their race, and who now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us, whom we name in our hearts before you. Especially, we thank you for Barbara Kelly, whom you have now received into your presence. Help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years and bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of your home. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite Dorothy to come forward to share her remembrance. Barbara Kelly was my big sister, and I'm here today, along with my husband, Bob, to honor her, and from a distance, our sons, Jeff and John, our daughters-in-law, Sarah and Carrie, and our grandchildren, Max, Charlie, Theo, and Hannah, honor her as well. All of us offered Jerry, who was so very good to her, and Jason, who was the light of her life, our love, support, deepest sympathy. But first, who were we, Barbara and I? Where did we come from? Barbara and I came from an extended big Greek family. Our grandparents were immigrants, as well as our father, who started his life in America by first stepping foot on Ellis Island. Our mother, Pauline Caminas Economides, was the oldest of six children. Our father, Theo Economides, was the youngest of five. They all mostly lived in Endicott, New York. They went forth and multiplied. So we had aunts, uncles, cousins, all over the place. Our father's family was kind, quiet, and reserved. Our mother's family was kind, boisterous, and sometimes outrageous. Barbara and I only had each other in our family. And we were quite a bit older than most of our cousins but we always had some kind of relative around for whatever reason. So what are my recollections of our early and teen years? There is nothing that can equal the treasures of so many memories, and I'm going to share just a few with you. Barbara took her role as my big sister quite seriously and taught me about so many things growing up. Our mother was often preoccupied with our family's thriving business, and Barbara looked after me in so many ways. She was so capable, capable, competent, and always did the right thing in the right way. We grew up loving, fighting, and all the things that two often temperamental sisters do. She the mature one, and me the bratty little sister. Barbara was number one in so many ways in our extended large family, as she was the firstborn grandchild, the first to go to school, the first to go to college, and the first to marry, and the first to have a child. While in our family, she was always the pride and joy with everyone else 
I'll tell you, she was the it girl in Anticop. While gathering my thoughts for today, I was reminded of the words written by Jacob Grimm in his favorite story, Little Red Riding Hood. Once upon a time, there was a dear little girl who was loved by everyone who looked at her. That was Barbara. She was so pretty, smart, artistic, sweet, and nice. I spent my childhood and teens in admiration of her. She excelled in school and was a very well-liked popular girl. When she took dancing lessons, she was the best one. When she took swimming lessons, she was also the best one and came a lifeguard during the summers at our community pool. When she took up debate, she became a champion debater in high school, as anyone who ever had an argument with her could certainly attest. She was self-assured, confident, but never ever conceited. I always wanted to be like her. I was so envious when I saw her in her teens, all dressed up, going off to a party, while I was at home making popcorn and watching Gunsmoke with my father. <laughs> at the same time, muttering to myself, maybe, maybe, maybe someday I can be like Barbara. I want to mention something uh, very silly, quite curious about growing up that always made us laugh and smile. For some unexplainable reason throughout our childhood and up till just recently, we always addressed each other with funny, weird names. As kids, we called each other Mrs. Leedy, Mrs. Duty, Teeth Out, and Moan Shirt. Our parents thought they were raising two lunatics. <laughs> and as we grew older, the most endearing and enduring name we called each other was Woof. We literally, even as adults, always called each other Woof. Every conversation began with Woof. Phone calls and emails always started with, hi Woof. Greeting cards and notes were signed, love Woof. Neither of us had any old idea where they came from. But we just loved calling each other Woof. And without fail, our telephone conversations, even our very last one, ended with the following words. Well, okay, gotta go. Talk to you soon. I love you. Bye-bye. Woof. Well, we finally <laughs> grew up, uh, still called each other Woof. And we really didn't see each other that much as adults busy with jobs, raising children, et cetera, et cetera. And Barbara had a full, busy life in Buffalo, and I the same in Philadelphia, and now Chicago. But when we did, we had a great time. We loved to shop, particularly for cool accessories, and probably had an un a shared, unhealthy passion for shoes. We delighted in giving each other unique and creative gifts. Many times, friends would ask me, where did you get that fabulous necklace or handbag? And often my response was, oh, my sister sent it to me. Every Christmas, she sent me Kudalakia that the Greek Orthodox Church sold at that time and always sent us one of those beautiful tins of De Camillo's uh, biscotti. As we know, later in life, she had many small health issues, followed by some very big ones. It was heartbreaking to know this strong, independent woman had to be so ill and dependent on so many others. She was strong and stubborn, and made me wonder how long she could take this, how long she could keep going. But then one day she couldn't. 
The last time I saw her was in Buffalo last year to celebrate her 80th birthday. And she hoped to come to Chicago sometime this year to see my family. Unfortunately, her trip to California would be her last. And then she was coming home to Buffalo. So now, to my beloved dear sister, Okay, well, gotta go. Talk to you soon. I love you. Bye-bye. Wolf. Jason, I invite you to come forward this year. I'd just like to welcome everyone out. Thank you so much for coming. Um, funerals are always really hard for me. I, I've, I've skipped a lot of them over the years because I, I just, I, I, uh, I can't stop from crying. And uh, uh, this one is, as you know, especially difficult. Um, Hope everyone had a great Easter. Um, if, have, if you're celebrating Passover, it's coming up, and Father Christos, uh, Greek Easter. I can't. I have to mention Greek Easter, right? Uh, May 5th is coming up. My mom was very Greek, and she made the best spanikopita. Uh, and she was always told everyone how Greek she was, and I loved it. It was, it was great, and she loved to tell me that I was Greek. And uh, most recently, uh, when she got sick, uh, in, I, I, I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I used to go to the Greek festival in New Orleans. And I would tell everyone, Look, I gotta go, I, I gotta drop everything. I have to go to the Greek festival. I gotta do it for my mom. <laughs> because she worked at the Greek festival. Uh, in, in Buffalo. So this last Greek festival in New Orleans, I was meeting different people and going to different booths and talking to people and um, people would ask me well what, what who are you what's your name and i would say my name is jason economides <laughs> <laughs> and uh oh okay you're definitely great <laughs> and i did that because i know my mom would be so proud and later on i i told her and she laughed, and she was, she was so happy. Uh, I'd like to share a couple uh, things about myself and my mom, um, some, some of the good times that we had, and some of the challenging times. Um, I, uh, I put my mom through a lot, and I feel bad. My mom, she was always there for me, and she always had my back. She may not have had the same interests as me. Uh, I played soccer, and um, when I was younger, um, I used to organize all these games in, in the neighborhood. and we'd, we'd play soccer, and we'd play football, and street hockey, my mom was always really worried that I was going to get hurt. And so one day we were having this street hot, and I loved to play with the older boys. I looked up to all the older boys. There was Philip Brookings and Bill Brookings and Mike Delano. 
and all of these older boys, and I tried to find all the oldest boys to play with. And so one day we were outside playing street hockey, and again, my mom was always worried I was gonna get hurt. So I ran inside and I had this cut above my eye and I was bleeding. I said, mom, mom, I, I got cut, you, you, I need a Band-Aid. You gotta bandage me up. And she was all worried. She thought she was gonna have to take me to the hospital. And I said, no, no. What you do is you just bandage me up, wrap it around, and then I'm gonna go back out and play. And she said, what? Are you crazy? I said, yes, my team is waiting for me. And so I said, they're right in the driveway. So she goes out to the driveway, she looks up, she goes, who are all those boys? I said, that's my team. We gotta finish the game, mom, hurry. Wrap it up, that's how they do it on TV. <laughs> I was just a real little guy. So anyway, um, I convinced her that it was okay and I ran back out and I played. So when I got a little bit older, um, maybe about nine, 10 years old, I, uh, I, I ran inside and I said, hey, mom, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have a lemonade stand. Okay, I need you to make some lemonade because I'm going to sell lemonade. So I set up this lemonade stand out front and my mom made the lemonade for me and we were selling lemonade. And I was selling it with one of my neighbors. Her name was Amy. So my mom's kind of watching from outside the window and uh, Amy got called in for lunch. And then when Amy came back, Amy was kind of in charge of keeping everything clean. I was handling the sales, and she was more the compliance person. She was very worried, and she was very neat. I was the messy one. I always had a reputation, too, with my mom for being way too messy. Well, anyway, so Amy came back from lunch, and there was cups everywhere, empty cups, and everything was a mess. She said, what happened? What's going on here? I said, we made a lot of sales. I, I, I sold all these lemonades. And so Amy said, this is, place is way too messy. I quit. I, I, I can't deal with you. So anyway, my mom, I never heard the end of it from my mom. She said, you fired Amy. What happened? I said, no, mom, I promise. I didn't fire Amy. She got called to lunch and she came back and she said, I can't deal with it. She said it was too messy. Anyway, so um, then when I got a little bit older, I uh, got a paper route and uh, I was delivering papers to all the neighbors. And you know, as a child, you always wanna please your mom, okay? And so I was always trying to do whatever I could to please her, it just, it's just human nature. And so, um, you know, I, I tried my hardest to be good and so she would say, um, before I would leave the house, uh, she would say, the, the, the thing that she would always say is, let me see you. Come here, let me see you. She'd straighten my shirt or say, your shoes aren't tied or you've only got one sock on, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? Or your shoes are on the wrong feet even. <laughs> So anyway, um, even as I got older and went to high school, it was always, let me see you. So she had to straighten my tie, she had to straighten my, uh, my shirt wasn't ironed. If there was one little thing out of place, I was in trouble or, you know, that, that would happen because she loved me so much and she wanted to make sure that I was straight. So anyway, we got up to, um, I was delivering papers and I, I, was, I had a friend and his name was Miles, Miles Ewing. And so Miles came around and Miles, he, uh, my mom loved Miles. Miles was from Tennessee and he had a Southern accent. And he came and he said, hi, Miss Barbara, with a Southern accent. And he said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can I help you with this, ma'am? Can I bring in the groceries for you, ma'am? And I'm watching Miles, and I, and I say, wow, I need to be more like Miles, I guess. 
because Miles, I mean, she couldn't stop talking about Miles. So then one day the phone rang, and uh, I answered the phone, and Miles also had a paper route, and Miles said, he, uh, the, the, his boss said, you know, Miles is having a little trouble with his paper route, Jason, I need you to help him. I need you to help with collections. So uh, I said, Mom, I gotta go help Miles. I gotta help him with his collections. He's having trouble with his collections. She said, okay, go, go run, help Miles. So I got, I was, you know, I was always looking for this positive reinforcement on the, uh, so I, I ran and I helped Miles and it was great. So then when I was in grade school, my mom wanted me to do violin, Suzuki violin. And I probably didn't have a, a musical bone in my body, but I, I did it. And I remember practicing the violin and doing the best I could and, and watching the kids play outside. And while I was practicing the violin, I even got private violin lessons at the violin uh, teacher's house. So um, then, you know, one day my mom, well, I used to always go to Nichols Day Camp because we, we played all kinds of sports at Nichols Day Camp. So that's where all my friends were. It was every summer. So then one day it was Parents' Day and my mom came and she was watching us play at Nichols Day Camp and there was a soccer game and I was real little and uh, I, I scored maybe four or five goals and then uh, she ran home and we were at the dinner table and she told my dad about it. So then my dad got me on a real soccer team. He asked me, well, do you want to play soccer? And I said, well, I already play soccer. I've got a soccer team. All my friends in the neighborhood, we play over at, on Soldier's Field. And he said, well, do you want to play for real? I said, sure, yeah. So then my dad started driving me to all these soccer games and tournaments, and I got to be a little bit older, and I went to a new school, Mount St. Joe's. And so when I went to Mount St. Joe's, um, I was a seventh grader, and growing up, um, you know, I idolized my dad. I always wanted to be like my dad. And uh, I knew that my dad, he had played football, and so I always wanted to play football. And I played it in the backyard and played it with my friends. And my dad would tell me about how he played football in Southern California, and that they won the high school Southern California championship. And I was heard these football stories. I was like, wow, I just wanted to be so much like my dad. So here I was playing soccer and playing f football, and sometimes I, my mom always said, well, you can play football, but just don't play tackle football. I don't want you to get hurt. And so um, we'd play football out in Soldier's Field, and there's a little field that we had down at the end of the block, and I got into junior high, and uh, I played on the school basketball team, and um, when I was in eighth grade, I said, Mom, you know, I don't want to play on the seventh and eighth grade soccer team. I said, I want to try out for the varsity soccer team in the high school. I said, I can't play with these seventh and eighth graders anymore. She said, well, you know, I don't want you to get hurt. You, you can't play with high schoolers yet. You're only in eighth grade. And I said, Mom, I can do it. I know I can. You've got to let me try. And so I tried out and I made the team. So as an eighth grader, I played on the varsity high school soccer team. And so my mom, growing up, my dad took me to all the soccer games. My mom didn't come to any of the games, but she came to my very first game in eighth grade when I was on the varsity soccer team. She said, I got to see this. If he's going to play and I heard that he's going to start, I got to be there. So my mom was right on the sidelines, standing next to the coach, Mr. Simon. And I'm thinking to myself, Mom, the fans are over on that side, okay? The players and the coaches are on this side. Why are you standing next to the coach? 
<laughs> so she stood there the whole game, watched the whole game right next to Mr. Simon, and we were playing Timon, and it was a real tough game. These are Irish boys from South Buffalo and Irish Catholic boys, and they were tough. This is back in the 80s. And uh, the, the score is one to one, and I'm talking to the, some of my, our midfielders. I was playing on the wing, and I was saying, look, this guy, this, this fullback isn't respecting me. I can beat him. You gotta send the ball through. I'll beat him. And, Okay. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, my uh, the, the midfielder sends it through, and again, I'm trying to uh, prove it to my mom that I can play at this level. So the midfielder sends the ball through. I run onto it, and I score a goal, and uh, we end up winning the game three to one. And I felt so proud of myself and so proud that my mom got to see that. And so then I got into high school and I, you know, I, I really put my mom through a lot. And um, I wish I could, my grades weren't good. And you know, I wish I could have done better to impress her. And um, you know, I, I did everything that I could, and I loved her very much. And uh, when I left for Baton Rouge, I still remember the day that I left, I got a job opportunity after high school, and she was sitting in the, in the kitchen, and I feel like I just hurt her feelings so bad because she was crying, and she didn't want me to go. And I just said, Mom, you know, it's time, I, I, I gotta go. And she said, well, okay. And, and uh, I felt bad that I hurt my mom's feelings so bad because I left Buffalo. And, and I've been gone for 25 years. And so I, I just never forget the, the look on her face when she was sitting in the kitchen that day that I left. Well, thank and you. So, thank you, Jason. I'm sure your mother. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for. And just in closing, I'd like to share one uh, one thing, uh, one scripture that comes to mind. It's in Galatians chapter five. Uh, I believe it's verse 22, and it says, "The fruit of the spirit is peace, love, joy, gentleness." kindness and self-control and i just like to leave you with that that may may all your families have that that spirit in their homes thank you so and, much uh, thank you so much thank you. Jerry. i'm gonna have to really shorten mine up now <laughs> so we can get through this <laughs> Uh, so I, I was going to start out by explaining how I met Barbara. Uh, it, it was a very odd situation where we had uh, a, a sorority party at Syracuse University and we were all talking the day afterwards and everyone had found dates and was talking about all the nice co-eds they had met and I hadn't met anyone. So I just kind of piped up and said, uh, okay, who was the absolute best looking girl at that party? And so they kind of looked at each other and said, it was probably that one in the red sweater who uh, had to leave early. She had a second date, so no one had much of a chance to talk to her. So I said, okay, I'm going after her. So she lived in Haven Hall. Uh, she was a junior, she did, uh, only the, only the uh, seniors uh, lived in the sorority house. And so back then it was coin-operated uh, telephones. So, and there was a different uh, telephone for each floor. And I didn't know which floor she was on. So on my, it cost a dime to make a call. That was a lot back then. So on my fifth dime, I finally reached her and uh, uh, told her she had to go out with me. and. Somehow I convinced her, I don't know how. So then I'm all worried about where to go and what to do. 
So the only restaurant I knew was Heinz Restaurant on Westcott Street. And so I charge over to Heinz and I talk to Mr. and Mrs. Heinz. And they say, uh, oh sure, Jerry, we'll, we'll get it all set up. We'll put you right up in our, our little balcony and uh, we, we'll put a long stem rose in a vase and uh, it'll be real nice. And I said, oh, that, that sounds good. It turned out to be a disaster because I forgot that all my buddies ate there too. And so they were downstairs looking up at me, gawking uh, with smirks on their face, and it was a most awkward situation. Anyway, after dinner, uh, I, did, I also forgot what to plan. I, I was so focused on dinner, and I, we were driving around, so back then, of course, you went out to the movies, and I was hunting for a movie. The first movie I ran into was Mary Poppins. So I sheepishly said, would you like to go to Mary Poppins? And she said, yes. So we went, and the whole thing was a big mess. I decided I wasn't going to call her back and apologize. I really just didn't have the nerve, and I wasn't going to call. But in the meantime, I somehow... I don't know if it was mental telepathy or what, but one, one of my buddies was going out with one of her friends in the sorority, and she had told uh, one of her sorority sisters uh, that she liked that boy from California. So I thought, wow, on a bad night she liked me? <laughs> so I called her up. <laughs> and. Of course, the rest is history. We were married in 1966, and uh, we went to Philadelphia, and I, as I indicated in the obituary, she had different jobs at that time. She worked at the Philadelphia Housing Authority. She worked, uh, she wanted to be a substitute, try, at least try and be a teacher, so she got a substitute teaching job in South Philly. And uh, she, where they, they, by the way, they would call her teach, and it's, she always told me they gave me wolf whistles when I walked to work. And then she finally got a job at John Wanamaker's, which was a preference because it was an elite department store, and she wanted to move into the clothing department and use her applied arts training. But Martin Luther King got assassinated, and I got a job opportunity with the brand new New York State Urban Development Corporation. And so we moved to Rochester. We called it UDC. Some of you have probably heard of it. She got a job in an art gallery, uh, which uh, she enjoyed. And she also used her seamstress, seamstress training, which today we'd call her a tailor, I guess. And she taught senior citizen sewing. Eventually, UDC was decentralized and we moved to Buffalo. And uh, we've been there ever since, since 1971. Uh, let's see, I'm on my... She came home one day and said she had, she, by the way, as Dorothy mentioned, I think, she was, uh, it was quite a dancing family uh, in the Cominas and the Economides family. And she was a very good dancer and she loved to dance. So one day I saw her working at her sewing machine and I asked her what she was making and she said it was a Middle Eastern uh, costume. And I said, oh. And I, she said, I met a small dance group that I want to join, and, and join she did. All of a sudden, she's getting hired to these high-end birthday parties, and then she's getting hired at these Middle Eastern restaurants where, I'm cer where I sit nervously in the back row watching people put dollar bills inside her belt. So, somehow we got through it. <laughs> but anyway, she was, Barbara was a perfectionist, and so when it was time to retire, she retired. 
and she was hunting for a way to carry on her interest. She had quite an interest that developed in Buffalo architecture, and so she joined Buffalo Guide Service. It was owned by Louise McClive, who many of you probably know, and when Louise retired, Barbara bought the company and expanded the tours and enjoyed it very much. She uh, uh, led tours all the way out to Montreal, to Quebec City, to Stratford uh, in Ontario, and uh, Toronto, and of course around Buffalo, Niagara Falls, and she had a famous directive to all her tour guides. See, I got it here somewhere, yeah. Do not read from your notes. Know your tour so you can speak and lead it with enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. She also had extracurricular activities. She was uh, on the Landmark Society board. Uh, she was on the original Hull House board to restore the original structure remaining in, Buffalo, in, in the Erie County. And she was on Mayor Massiello's first uh, committee to restore Canal Side. She loved her dual membership in Westminster and the Greek Orthodox Church. She was proud, she thought she was the only one that had that dual membership. And uh, she was longtime president and member of the Greek senior citizens. She ran Yaya's Attic, the Greek flea market for many years at the Greek festival. Despite all this, she loved to read and I, I'd be remiss Pearl Spurl will kick me if I don't mention that she loved her book clubs and she made many friends in her book clubs. I'd often find her on the back deck sunning herself reading a book. When she had her stroke six and a half years ago, we moved to Canterbury Woods and she had one requirement for the move. We had to be able to bring her beloved cats, Mr. Orange and Margo, and they agreed. So, we've been in uh, we've been in in uh, Canterbury Woods for uh, since that time, six and a half years ago. Let me conclude with a uh, a message, a farewell message. Dear Barbara, maybe I didn't love you quite as often as I could have. Maybe I didn't comfort you quite as much as I should have. But dear, you were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. Maybe I didn't hold you during some lonely, lonely times. Little things I should have said and done I could have taken the time, but you were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. I so wish that your sweet love hadn't died so that I'd have one more chance to keep you satisfied. You were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. I will conclude and tell you that I have learned a new experience. I, I, I have learned a wonderful lesson. And the, you, you can put together all the exciting real estate deals in the world, but this activity pales in importance to another activity which I've come to learn. And this is being the loving caretaker of just one other human being in need. I have two beloved nurses who I couldn't have lived without during the last six years. Barbara, Jason, and I consider them part of our family, and I'd like everyone to meet them. I'm not sure Felicia, is Felicia here? Oh, good. Uh, would Felicia and uh, uh, Brown and Terry Roselle please stand up?
Felicia, you were supposed to sit in front.
please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Eternal God, your love for us is everlasting. You alone can turn the shadow of death into the brightness of the morning light. Help us to turn to you with believing hearts. In the stillness of this hour, speak to us of eternal things, so that hearing the promises in Scripture, we may have hope and be lifted above our distress into the peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from Psalm 146. Listen to the word of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes and mortals in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And from the Gospel of John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you to Dorothy for your remembrance of your sister, and Jason for your mother, and to Jerry for the sharing of your beloved. Your words spoke to us. Barbara was a dear sister, a giving mother, a loving wife, and a deep friend. She was a committed member to both Westminster Presbyterian and the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church, whose priest, Father Christos, led Barbara's graveside service earlier this morning. Thank you for being with us this morning as well, and welcome to the members of Barbara's Annunciation Greek family. Having known Barbara and just getting to know Father Christos, it is obvious that you all keep good company, so welcome. Barbara had quite a life, as you have already heard. She was sister, wife, mother, cheerleader, debater. Some of you were victims to that, I understand. She was teacher, social worker, accomplished dancer, tour guide. She held many titles throughout her life. Yet first and foremost, 
Barbara's title was that of a child of God. She embraced this identity, and she lived into this identity. I can imagine her voice speaking the portion of our gospel, stating, Let not your hearts be troubled. Through so many of you, and through those who are unable to be present with us this day, Barbara found joy in life. And proof of such joy lives within your memories. As Dorothy said, your memories are to be treasured. And be reminded that like all treasures, your memories are meant to be shared with one another. I encourage you to share memories today. Couple your memories with memories that you have heard. And may your memories help to uphold Jason and Jerry. Yet in the here and now, it seems that silence replaces Barbara's presence. We cannot deny there is an emptiness where she once stood. Be reminded that God continues to speak from the silence, calls out from the emptiness proclaiming both mystery and promise that God loves so much that God has chosen to come and walk alongside us in the midst of this world and God is no stranger to death as Christ suffered and died though in his resurrection he defeated death proclaiming the ultimate victory over all in this world, even victory over death itself. Like any life lived, Barbara's life had its good and great times and its challenging and difficult times. Life became especially difficult following her stroke. Life is not always easily lived, though life is meant to be journeyed with others. And Barbara journeyed this life with her family and with her community of friends. Life has its peaks and its valleys, its highs and its lows, and even on those darkest nights, God is ever present. Perhaps not always experienced, maybe not always recognized. Yet love is present through all. Our shepherd God guides us through, leading us toward the still waters and the green pastures of life, being ever present with us in the valleys and through the shadows of darkness, always leading us toward God's very self, that we may receive a comfort beyond understanding. I imagine life for Barbara did have its peaks and its valleys, its highs and its lows. And God was present. Love was present. Love is present through all. Present with his disciples, our gospel text captures a sense of the love Jesus had for his friends. The context of our gospel message is set on Maundy Thursday in the upper room where Jesus shares his faith with his followers, that he will die on the next day, that he will be taken from those who love him so dearly, that his presence from that day forward would be different. No one, not even the disciples, could truly be prepared for the finality that comes with death. Even when anticipated, death overwhelms. The disciples were certainly overwhelmed, not prepared to say goodbye to Jesus. And we too understand this. How can anyone be prepared to say goodbye? From within that upper room, Jesus then spoke these words to the disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, 
what I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The truth of this ancient promise remains true this day. As Barbara passed from the loving arms of her family, from the arms of her friends, she was fully embraced into the arms of our Creator, the Creator of love. For nothing shall separate us from the love of God, a love that keeps us, a love that shall never let us go. So in this time, in this in between time. The time between a promise given and a promise fulfilled. It is in this time that we lean on one another, trusting the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who reminds us of Jesus' words Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Amen. It is my honor to invite Father Christos to come forward to share a closing prayer. In honor of Barbara, a couple of lines will be in Greek. Blessed is our God always, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Ευλογητός ο Θεός ημών πάντοτε, νυν και αή και εις τους αιώνας των αιώνων. Αμήν. Have mercy upon us, O God, according to your great mercy. We pray to you, hear us, and have mercy. Again, we pray for the repose of the soul of the departed servant of God, Barbara, and for the forgiveness of all her sins, both voluntary and involuntary. 
May the Lord God grant that his soul rest where the righteous repose. Let us ask for the mercies of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the forgiveness of his sins from Christ, our immortal King and God. Let us pray to the Lord. O God of spirits and of all flesh, you have troubled upon death and have abolished the power of the devil, giving life to your world. Give rest to the soul of the departed servant Barbara in a place of light, in a place of repose, in a place of refreshment, where there is no pain, sorrow, and suffering. As a good and loving God, forgive every sin she has committed in thought, word, or deed. For there is no one who lives and does not sin. You are alone or without sin. Your righteousness and everlasting righteousness and your word is truth. For you are the resurrection, the life, and the repose of your departed servant Barbara, Christ our God, and to you we give glory with your eternal Father and your holy and good life-giving spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May Christ, our true God, who rose from the dead and as immortal King has authority over the living and the dead, have mercy on us and save us. Through the intercessions of his spotless Holy Mother, of the holy, glorious, and praiseworthy apostles, of our venerable and God-bearing fathers, of the holy and glorious forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of his holy and righteous friend Lazarus, who, who lay in the grave four days, and of all the saints, establish the soul of his servant Barbara, departed from us in the dwelling place of the saints. Grant rest to her in the bosom of Abraham, and number here among the righteous. May your memory be eternal, dear sister in Christ, worthy of blessedness and everlasting memory. Eunia sui mnimi, axiomacaristos, και aimnistos, adelphi mon. May your memory be eternal, dear sister in Christ, worthy of blessedness and everlasting memory. And again, in honor of Barbara, I'll finish with the Easter resurrection greeting and prayer although the Greek Orthodox Easter is, hasn't happened yet, but in honor of her, we'll say from now the proclamation of the resurrection, which Barbara knew from a young girl, I'm sure, in her family. Christos anesti ek nekron, thanato thanaton patisas, ke tis mnimas in zoin charisamenos. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tombs he has bestowed life. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you. The Lord look to you with mercy and give you peace both now and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.